Well, hello and welcome to Christ Church Online. My name is Nigel Fortescue, and as a member of the ministry team, I want to welcome you to church at Christ Church St Ives today. Whether this is your first time or your 1,001st time, it's great to have you as part of our community. And we pray that you'll be comforted and challenged as we engage with God through his word today. Well, get excited because we have two new things for you today. First, at Christchurch, we love people and want you to be known and cared for as you are built up as a wholehearted disciple of Jesus. So to that end, we are introducing a new check-in opportunity for everyone. Uh, we'd love you to hit the check-in button in the chat right now and let us know that you are here. Uh, by doing that, you can ask a question, make a comment, get help to connect with our community or find out more about Jesus. So please check in now by hitting the button in the chat and let's stay connected together. Uh, what else is new? Well, secondly, we are starting a brand new series today in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this short letter is written by a pastor to one of his churches at a time when he is physically separated from them and longing to be gathered with them face to face. And we thought that it sounded like the perfect part of the Bible to study in this pandemic season when we are physically separated but united in Christ. Uh, Elliot Temple is going to preach on chapter one, but first I'm going to pray and then we are going to sing together. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are united together in Christ, even though we are distanced apart. We thank you that we are able to be nourished by your word today, uh, through the scriptures, through our singing together. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that despite the fact that we cannot be in each other's physical presence, that we would be an encouragement to each other today. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, let's get stuck in and let's sing Rock of Ages together. Thank you. 
Well, friends, I'm here with Caroline Litchfield, who's on the pastoral staff of our church and also has particular responsibility for growth groups. Uh, Caroline, we're about to get stuck into the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we've got a great opportunity mm. to have God speak to us through this little letter. Mm. But I would like to know, what do you love about the book of 1 Thessalonians? It's a great question, isn't it, as you come to a new book? I love in 1 Thess the, that you get the sense of the great affection that Paul and co and, mm. and Silas and um, Timothy have for the Thessalonian believers. Mm. Like you read it and it's just infused throughout uh, their great affection and love for them and also for the church members' uh, love for Paul and the others. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I love that as well. I also love that in just a short little letter, mm. five chapters, it is so rich with deep theology. Mm. It, it's almost like every major point of theology is ticked off in yeah. this letter. We hear about the death of Christ, the Christian life, the future for yeah. the Christian, and all manner of things that are so critically important, mm. which makes a bit of sense given the importance of Thessalonica as a mm. city in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, Thessalonica still exists, actually. It's now known as Thessaloniki. Uh, it is at the north end of the Aegean mm -hmm. Sea. It's nestled there in Greece. Uh, and you can go and visit it if you would like to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great metropolitan city of more than a million people. So it was a very important city in mm -hmm. those days, still an important city today. But what we really want to know is, as we read this letter mm -hmm. that uh, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, what are some things that we ought to be looking out for to help us orient ourselves to our reading of the letter? Yeah, well, there's three key things to keep in mind. So the gospel, living to please God and looking for the evidence of that relationship between Paul and the Thessalonian believers. Mm -hmm. So firstly, the gospel. Paul talks about, he uses the word, the gospel or God's message it's peppered throughout the letter. So have a look, look out for that uh, as you're reading. But he also uses some, some sentences, multiple verses to, to explain the gospel message. So the first one is at the end of chapter one from um, halfway through verse nine. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Mm. It's such a great description, isn't it? Of isn't it? Yeah. Like the gospel and, and our response that, that they did the U-turn. They turned to God from idols, which we know there were lots of idols in, mm. in that Thess uh, the city of Thessalonica. Um, so as you read the letter, keep a lookout. There's a few others uh, throughout the letter. Uh, because for Paul, the gospel is, that's the, that is the big thing. That is reality. And so mm. everything flows out of uh, and comes out of and is impacted by the gospel. So that's the first thing. The second one is the whole idea of living to please God. So oh, yeah. the impact of the gospel then. Um, and so, and you get that, the, the, the language showing that Paul is so encouraged that the Thessalonians, they're, they're still going, they're keeping on, and he just wants them to do it more and more. So look mm. out for the more and more, that pops up a few times. Um, but particularly, Paul talks about uh, faith and love and hope. So there's a couple of times he talks about those together, uh, but also he talks about them separately. So sneaky, isn't it? The it he is. just gets that back in there. Yes, I, I know, it. it's great. And then um, the idea of joy uh, and the theme of encouragement. So all of those keywords, look, look for them as, mm. you, as you're reading through the letter, um, because all of those come out of the gospel. That's in response to being saved. Uh, that's what Paul is longing for all believers, for us as well, to be, to be uh, still going, to keep going, to keep doing it more and more. Yeah. So that's the second one. And the third one, the, the closeness of the relationship. Um, so particularly in chapter two and three, so he talks about those beautiful phrases of, you know, we were like young children among you. We were, we cared for you like an, a, a nursing mother. Uh, we dealt with you as a father. Um, and there's a few others, so have a look. But just, it, it, yeah, it is a challenge, isn't it? As we think about our, our, our love for each other in the church, in our church family, do we have that same affection? I think, yeah, it's, a, it's such a fabulous letter. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Caroline. Well, let's get stuck into it. We're gonna have our Bible reading now, and then Elliot is going to come and speak to us. Hi, everyone. My name's James and I attend the 1030 congregation, and I'll be reading from God's word to us today. 
The reading comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out for, from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. I once found myself alone on a stage in front of 500 people and I was wearing white tights, a white skivvy and green muscle patches sewn into the skivvy and a green cape and I was meant to be acting as a superhero and you know superheroes larger than life but for me I'm a bit nervous on stage acting and so all of my movements were inhibited and I was meant to be doing the voice to a mouth over, a voiceover. As I moved my mouth, I felt so embarrassed that my mouth locked jawed and I couldn't properly speak. However, in the back row, you could see from the distance the fear in my eyes. You could see it all over my face. It didn't go well. It didn't end well. I didn't sleep well. And the worst thing about it is that I had to do it all over again the next evening. But on the final night, I got to be myself. It was so much better because, you know, isn't it true that when you speak from your inmost convictions, it comes across more naturally. You can tell when someone's acting. You can tell when someone's fake. You can see it in their eyes from the back row. But when someone speaks from their deepest convictions, it's natural and maybe even a little bit inspiring. Well, today we're opening up this new letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. And the Thessalonians are not fakers, they're not actors. In fact, they're very much like the Lord Jesus, they're very much in step with the apostles. We often look back and wish that we could be more like the apostles, but you know, we often feel like we're not doing a very good job of it. But the Thessalonians had a reputation. Their image was much like the apostles. And so this letter in 1 Thessalonians is dripping with thankfulness because the Thessalonians are doing such a great job. And so as we open up this new series, we can be excited and positive to open an uplifting letter in the Bible. So I'm going to start by seeing the thankfulness in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
You feel the thankfulness from the very opening. And Paul and Silas and Timothy are thanking God. There's three of them, we, but it's a little bit like a Christmas card, you know, when one member of the family writes it on behalf of all of the family members. The I in this letter is Paul, and the we is Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Uh, and they are thanking God continuously. We tend to thank people quite regularly. We thank people because we respect people and we're grateful for everything they've done. But here we see that thankfulness for people is an outflow of thankfulness to God. We are, as Christians, first to thank God and then our thankfulness to people will flow out of our thankfulness to God. It's very good to be thankful, isn't it? Not just sometimes for a few people, but for all the people continually, like Paul, who continually mentions them in his prayers. And he thanks God continually from his memory remembering them in his prayers and this is true in prayer isn't it that the people that you are praying for are usually not there with you in your daily prayers as you recall and you remember people how true is this especially right now during the coronavirus and our isolation we can't be together to pray together and so it is an act of memory we remember each other we pray for each other and in the case of Paul, he's actually in a different city to the Thessalonians. And so he's praying from another place because he's prevented from being with them. And so it's out of memory. But more than that, it's a spoken prayer, not necessarily verbally out loud, but he mentions them in his prayers. And perhaps you're not an overly expressive person. I can resonate with that in my own family. Our family is full of thankfulness, but it often goes unspoken. And yet here we see that the thankfulness feeling is expressed. Feeling thankful and expressing thankfulness aren't the same thing. Paul is expressing and mentioning thankfulness to God for the Thessalonian people. It's good to express thanks like this, isn't it? It's good to thank God. It's good to thank God out of our memory. And it's good to thank God for specific people. I'm thankful for many people in the life of this church. And, you know, I would like to list them all right now, an overflowing, bubbling thankfulness to God. Uh, but it would be a bit like a wedding speech, you know, the end of a wedding speech, how the bride and groom often want to give thanks to God for all the people in the room and it goes on and on and on and on. I suspect Paul's, you know, his own uh, thankfulness would have been a bit like a wedding speech. It would have been dripping with names and thanks. But why? Why is Paul so thankful for the Thessalonians? What is it about the Thessalonians that he wants to thank God about? And the answer is because they are so sincere in their faith, they are wholehearted in their Christian walk, they're thoroughly converted to follow Jesus, they're completely convicted deeply inside themselves, and that is overflowing into a transformed life of faith and walking, which is Paul's greatest joy because his life's work is about seeing people converted convicted and transformed into the likeness of Jesus. This is his hope, his joy and his crown, as we see later in the letter. And so listen to this description in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. The Thessalonians are changed inwardly, in the heart. The gospel has gone into their ears and landed in their heart, and they have been shaped and renewed and transformed. Their heart is guiding them. And the heart is a powerful guide, isn't it? What the heart 
loves drives the entire walk. The affections in our heart shape the direction we go. And so Ashley Null has this quote, what the heart loves, the will chooses and the mind justifies. The point that he's making there is that we are led from our heart in conviction. It flows into our wills, into our lives, and it even overrides our mind at times as we follow our hearts. So conviction from the heart, the Thessalonians, living it out. And this is different to simply intellectually knowing your Bible. It is knowing it in your heart so that it drives your life. The Thessalonians aren't sitting around in Bible clubs, going through the motions, talking about the Bible like a bunch of abstract concepts. They're not, as one illustration put it, a rotting sponge. They're not taking in the word and soaking it in and then sitting there on the bench top, soaking in their own rot as they do nothing with it. But they have been designed to express and expel that goodness out into the world as they go out and live the Christian life. The Thessalonians have work produced by faith. They have labor prompted by love and endurance inspired by hope. They are inspired and inspiring. What is this work and this labor that they are living by? What is their lifestyle? The answer is in verse 6. Verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. The Thessalonians imitate the Lord Jesus. And this is the answer. This is the work and the lifestyle that you would observe in the Thessalonian church. They are imitating the Lord and the apostles. Imitation. Jesus, the Lord, is the prototype. Paul, Silas and Timothy and the apostles are each a replica. And the Christians are duplicates. The Thessalonians are copying their image and model. But what does it look like exactly to imitate the Lord Jesus and the apostles? If you think of imitation, what do you think of? Now, I'm sure you think of many things. There's many things that we do to imitate Jesus. But what's at the core? And I would hate for you to miss this because we can fill this picture of imitation and wholehearted discipleship with many things. But there's two that are on focus here. And I want to ask what are the two things that are on focus in this passage? So before I explain what the two things are, maybe I'd like to ask you to reflect on this as a church and for you individually. Christ Church St. Ives, do you think that we have these two attributes in our DNA? Do we imitate the Lord in these two central ways? Do we have a reputation for this? This is perhaps something that you can have a talk about further in your growth groups. But let me introduce you to the two things. Here they are, in my own words, and I'll show them in the passage in a minute. The two things are suffering and spreading. Suffering relates to persecution. Jesus was killed in protest, suffered. The apostles were persecuted, they suffered. The early church was opposed. They were persecuted. They suffered. And then the second idea, spreading, relates to spreading salvation. Jesus suffered to spread salvation. The apostles suffered to spread the gospel of salvation. And churches always, everywhere, suffer as we continue to do the work of spreading salvation. Now let's check if I'm understanding imitation in Thessalonians correctly. I'd like to uh, look at two passages to demonstrate that this is what imitation is in this letter. Uh, let's look at it twice, firstly in chapter 2 and then coming back to our passage. So chapter 2, verse 14, look for imitation here. It says, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered 
from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the, prof and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. So you see the word suffering there a couple of times. Why the suffering? The suffering's from hostility. Why the hostility? The hostility is because of speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In other words, suffering for spreading the good news of Jesus. And the hostility isn't just to the apostles. The hostility here is to all of them, to everyone, because everyone is a part of this church vision to see the gospel go out into the world. And therefore, we are all suffering together the persecution that comes with it. So that's from chapter 2, but let me show it to you in chapter 1 from our own passage. So chapter 1, verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere so you see the two ideas there suffering and spreading they are suffering with joy in the holy spirit as the message rings out from this church suffering and spreading now some people say that faith is private but it's impossible faith is not some side point that lives in the corner of your life that doesn't change or have bearing on every part of what you do. No, for the Thessalonians, faith produces work, it prompts labor, and it inspires endurance. It can't be contained. It bursts outward. It resounds in all the world. Faith can't be private. It gives motion to every aspect of your existence and it becomes visible for everyone to see. Privatization of religion is not a Christian value. Separation of church and state, yes. Privacy of faith, no. Christians cannot help but emanate God and his message wherever they go in public and private life. Faith rings out and it's heard everywhere. Now, people might object, my faith is my faith, your faith is your faith. And we can empathise with this. You can't force faith. Governments that force faith are wielding a power that's beyond the authority and opportunity of the government. And the church that seeks to force faith is out of step with the Jesus who offers faith. And it's true that Christians can be pushy, Christians can be dominant, and Christians at times can be overzealous. But if no one shared their faith, where would we be? Where would the Thessalonians be? Where would Christ Church Shanives be? The Thessalonians wouldn't have, verse 9, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The Thessalonians wouldn't have received this great salvation. To the Thessalonians, a public faith is the most natural thing in the world because they've found salvation in Jesus Christ, who rescues them from the coming wrath. And no one needs to say to them, go and spread this good news because they're convinced that it's good news enough to go and suffer for it. Let me ask you the same thing. Christchurch, how are we tracking in these two areas of imitation? Are we similar to the Thessalonian church? Are we an example and a model? Do we imitate Christ and the apostles by suffering and spreading? Because here's the pointy end of the passage today. And I say it to myself and I say it to all of us. Elliot Temple, if the good news isn't spreading out from you, then you've lost your conviction 
that the good news is good news. I say the same to all of you, Christ Church. If the message of salvation isn't spreading out from you, then you have lost the conviction that the good news is good news. This is the best thing we can offer in the world right now. The good news of the gospel. This is, this is spiritual support. This is news for the soul. And you know, I'm very apologetic in some ways that I'm taking this very rich thankfulness passage and I'm turning it into a pointy shove or some sort of challenge. I know that in the middle of the coronavirus, everyone wants to have a great amount of support and we need to be kind to each other and draw together with kindness. And so, you know, am I doing you a disservice by coming in here and giving a pointy end sermon like this, challenging you to do more and to do more? But here's the thing is that this really is good news right now for all people. And Christians are resourced for suffering like no one else. So let's imitate Jesus. Let's take this moment of suffering. Let's push out with the good news of Jesus who brings comfort for the soul. I agree with the words of Jonathan Edwards. And I'm going to read this slowly, see if you could take it in. This spiritual light is the dawning of the light of glory in the heart. There is nothing so powerful as this to support persons in affliction and to give the mind peace and brightness in this stormy and dark world. We have glory in our hearts, spiritual good news, and we can offer this spiritual renewal to other people. Now, if you feel convicted and you worry for yourself that you struggle to be a part of this, the solution isn't to go and do what you're told. Push out, go on, do it all. Listen to what Elliot said. Instead, the solution is to seek the Spirit's conviction in your heart for it to bubble over imitating the lord jesus is the fruit of conviction it's the fruit of a devotional life that finds the bible as sweet as honey it's the fruit of growth groups that land in the application it's the fruit of preaching that stirs you from the inside in the heart and it's the fruit of prayer as we ask god to save the people that we love you can't fake this you can't act this like when i stood on stage and i was totally uncomfortable wearing a cape but when i got to be myself the conviction rolled off my tongue in the speech that i gave on the final night so let's believe that the good news is good news and let's turn from idols to the true and living god and seek power from his holy spirit let's strengthen each other and work on this together as growth groups and as a community. Let's help each other. And I hope that you would feel that I'm approachable enough that you could come to me and talk to me about this at any stage. It's my favorite thing to talk about. And over all of this, let's put on thankfulness. Let's be thankful, specifically thankful, wedding speech thankful. There is so much to be thankful for as we turn to God and give him thanks for all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all he will do for us and through us and in the world. Amen.
I'm from the 645 congregation and we're going to spend some time in prayer to our Heavenly Father. Today we'll be praying off the back of Elliot's sermon, uh, what God has taught us from 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be praying for the COVID-19 situation, particularly for those feeling isolated. And at the end, would you join me together as we say the Lord's Prayer. But now, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the gift of your son, Jesus, that through him and by his blood, we can draw near to you with great confidence. Thank you that we can come before you now in prayer, though it may seem virtual. Lord, help our hearts to draw near to you now, that we would come before you earnestly and delight in sitting at your feet, that you would hear our prayer. Father, help our souls to be overjoyed with the news that you have chosen us because the gospel has come to us, not only with power, but also with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for convicting us of our need for Jesus. Please continue to do this daily. 
Grant in us a humble posture that comes before you and asks for you to search us, find any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Our Lord and our refuge, help us by the strength the Holy Spirit gives us to keep imitating Christ day by day. Remind us continually by your Spirit that you have given us everything we need in Christ to be more like him. Please convict us now in each of our hearts where we can grow to be more like Christ today. We pray that your spirit would be at work in us to help spread the joy of salvation. Help us to persevere, to evangelize, though it may look different at the moment, would you still be bringing people into your everlasting kingdom in these times? God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to endure hostility, whatever it is that we face. Help us to persevere with the joy that is given us by your Holy Spirit. Our Lord and Master, help us to turn from idols daily, to serve you humbly, and to wait for your glorious Son's return. Great God, help us to trust in the depths of our hearts that you are completely sovereign and in control amidst COVID-19. We praise you for your goodness and thank you for the way things are looking in Australia. But Lord, help our hearts to yearn as yours does for those nations around the world that are more dire than us. We ask that we would yearn for their salvation and their safety, just as we do for those in Australia. Help leaders and politicians to make wise and informed decisions for the people they are responsible for. We pray for those at the moment who are feeling particularly isolated because of COVID-19. God, we thank you for easing restrictions, but we think of those who are still unable to see loved ones, family and friends, whether it be by choice or not by choice, or because of distance. We ask that you would give them comfort. We pray for those that know these people who are feeling isolated, ourselves included, we ask that you would help them to reach out, message them, call them, send gifts or care packages, notes, or show them other practical love. Our Father, we ask ultimately that they would know you as their loving Heavenly Father and pray that they would delight in the great comfort and joy to be found in being a child of the Lord of all. We pray all these things in your Son's almighty and everlasting name. Amen. Let's join in saying our Lord's Prayer. Please follow the words on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, what a great time we've had together today. Uh, do you remember the pointy end of Elliot's sermon? That challenge, that if the good news isn't spreading out from you, you may have lost your conviction that the good news is indeed good news. Why don't you take a moment uh, after you finish watching today or through this week to stop and ponder and pray. Is the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection still good news to you? Because it is God's good news for the world. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. Don't forget to check in uh, in the chat right now. You'll be able to do that. We'd love to know that you are here because we love people at Christchurch St Ives and we love you and want you to be known and cared for. And for those regular members of our church community, we want to encourage you to continue to give financially to the work of the gospel here at St Ives and to stay connected with us through all the regular channels. If you're joining us for the first time or you're just stepping into our Christchurch community, then please make sure you be in touch via our website. We'd love to connect you in deeply so that you can be a part of what God is doing here. And we are so thankful for all that God is doing through us. So it's been a great morning. Continue to ponder the good news of Christ and whether that good news is still good news for you. Have a great day.